Welcome to beautiful Camp Stonewater, a summer getaway full of adventure. The maddest of mad lads you've ever seen. Man, what the hell are we supposed to be looking for anyway? Your, Your mother. mother. And you can't forget the women who love to play baseball with no bra on. That's what I'm talking about. But a dark specter looms over Camp Stonewater. A mean old caretaker who was burned alive by a prank gone wrong. And after five years of failed skin grafts, he discovers that he is too hideous even to be fucked by a hooker. So instead of getting his knob schlobbed, he goes on a killing spree. The movie where a guy is too weird looking to get laid so he kills people. Harvey Weinstein's first movie by the way, just saying. So for today's video, let's take a look at The Burning. This video was sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is my favorite streaming service, it's basically the Netflix of horror. This month I'm going to recommend you watch the original Day of the Dead. Throughout the years a lot of my friends didn't like it at first and after I got them to rewatch they reappraised it and now they think it's awesome, because it is awesome. Why wait till October to celebrate Halloween? Shudder is once again supersizing the spooky season with 61 days of Halloween starting in September. Shudder's biggest, best lineup of new movies, new series, and classic favorites ever. The month kicks off with two Shudder originals hot off the film festival circuit. Rental Gone Wrong Thriller Superhost on September 2nd, and Ghostly Chiller Martyrs Lane on September 9th. Then things really heat up with the new season of Creepshow premiering September 23rd. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Vicious Fun, the Mortuary Collection, and PG, Psycho Goreman, plus all the best horror documentaries and the hit Creepshow TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder for 30 days, just go to shudder.com and use code WANG. The Burning is a movie that, while well-loved by hardcore horror fans, I think is also often overlooked. As a part of the oversaturated 80s slasher field, it's potentially written off as a not-as-good imitation of Friday the 13th, despite having begun production before Friday came out, and at the same time, it wasn't really as inventive as films like Sleepaway Camp. But despite not having the mainstream success of its counterparts, it's a production that has a lot of power hidden within it, having helped to launch the careers of Holly Hunter, Jason Alexander, and, of course, the Weinstein brothers as well as having ramifications that were felt by other productions at the time, such as Mad Men or Friday the 13th Part 2. The film begins with a group of young campers plotting their revenge on the groundskeeper Cropsey, who, among other vague accusations, is said to have beaten one of the campers. They're gonna prank him so good, he'll think twice next time. And it's prank time. You just been pranked? So Cropsy finds himself in the hospital where the staff are now using him as their own personal freak show. After you see this guy, you never want to come back in here again. Come on, man. Five years of failed skin grafts later, he's released into the world with an apology that the doctors basically gave up and advice not to blame the kids who did this to him so much. So you're laying in a hospital bed for five years. What's the first thing you're going to do when you get out? The answer, of course, is go to Times Square and get your dick sunk. But this is the 80s, so Pikachu and Elmo are not there to provide this service, so I guess you're gonna have to settle for a regular old O. The fornicatrix beckons Cropsy to remove his fedora when she realizes that this man is too mangled looking to bang even for money. So what he does is he stabs her to death with a little pair of scissors. But scissors are for boys. Garden shears are for men, and it's what he upgrades to when it's time to get his revenge on the kids. That being said, as it turns out, neither Cropsey's actor nor any of the other actors could handle the shears the way that the director, Tony Malum, wanted. So he performed those scenes as Cropsey himself. I've actually seen some people online say that Harvey Weinstein was the one who did these scenes, which would be some shit, but according to Malum, he is the one who did Cropsey for most of the movie. And now back at the camp, we meet some of the campers. In the middle of the bouncy titty baseball game, we see a young Jason Alexander who really still looks like classic George Costanza. He's just got that variation of that Arn Anderson type energy where you imagine he's looked middle-aged since the day he was born. And he's sure to let us know that even back then, George likes his chicken spicy. Hey, divine this, that's prime meat, you ain't buying <laughs> Damn George, what are you gonna do with all that ass? Now you got Tiger, who narrowly escapes certain death chasing a ball past Cropsey, who stalks her with Vaseline vision. As in, they literally smeared Vaseline on the camera to do an effect that would represent what it would look like through Cropsey's eyes. 
And then we've got Alfred. Alfred likes to look at things, such as titties, especially Sally's titties. This time, Alfred's special boob spotting abilities will get him in trouble. But believe it or not, they actually eventually save the day. But for now, he's in trouble as he gets accosted by Sally's tough guy boyfriend with a fake accent that's half Fonzie, half Gabagool. I'm gonna tear you up so bad, your own mother won't recognize you. He's Glazer, Camp Stonewater's Budnick. Lucky for Alfred, Camp Counselor Todd breaks them up and gives Glazer a talking to, during which Glazer distracts himself by flexing his pecs. The Glazer vs. Alfred feud intensifies throughout the day with back and forth of shenanigans, and then late at night, base trad Glazer scolds the boys for looking at nudie magazines. You guys are a real bunch of wimps, you know that? Looking at girly magazines. You guys make me sick. But Alfred ain't done looking at things for the night. It was a face! A horrible face at the window! You know I can hear you, right? The next day, the campers embark on a canoe trip led by Todd, who goes on to tell the campers the legend of Cropsey around the campfire. What's interesting here is that there's a bit of a meta thing going on here, with the film itself being inspired by an actual Cropsey urban legend typically told in the New York area around campfires. In the original variation, Cropsey is a well-liked regular guy until a fire set by an irresponsible camper spreads and burns his children to death. Hellbent on revenge, he stalks the camp looking for kids to kill. It's essentially a cautionary tale to keep young campers safe, Smokey the Bear, but make it brutal. So then you got the Weinsteins looking for a way to break into the film industry, wanting to make something low budget that's going to make a lot of money, so they choose to jump on the slasher craze that was started by Halloween in 1978 and was still going strong. They settle on this urban legend, which is perfect for the format. So perfect that, in fact, another film, Mad Men, was also originally written about it and ultimately had to be rewritten to avoid similarities to The Burning. Then when Todd finishes telling his tale. Oh shit, is that Cropsey? No. It's just Chuck Testa. Anyway, this is a slasher movie in a camp, so it's time to get naked. After showing off what a wild and crazy guy he is. You know what he does? He takes these paper bags, see? He fills them with dog shit. Then he lights them, leaves them in front of somebody's door. When they open the door, they go <laughs> like that. Eddie convinces Karen to go skinny dipping. But when Karen insists that she's not DTF, Eddie shoos her away like a flock of dirty pigeons. Get the fuck out of my face. Going back to acquire her clothes that are now strewn about, Karen becomes the first victim of Cropsey's scissor upgrade, her throat cut with lingering shots of bloody side boob. The next morning, the other campers wake up to find that both Karen and the canoes are missing. The campers break off to collect wood to build a raft to find the missing canoes when Alfred spies something with his little eye. Not here. What's the matter now? You know you want to? Are you noticing kind of a theme here? This is the 180s teen slasher where instead of everybody fucking, nobody fucks and they're all mad about it. But they manage to get the makeshift raft together without Glazer's help, and a party of five goes searching for the lost canoes. It does not go well. The kids find one of the lost canoes, but it has a stowaway. Cropsy jumps up from the boat and inflicts a series of kills in increasing intensity, stabs a camper named Fish in the chest, Barbara takes it in the belly, Woodstock tries to block, but it's not effective and he gets his fingers cut off. Eddie then gets the shears shoved into his neck from the front and pushed up with that specific bending motion in his neck, most likely being the reason that this film wound up in the UK video nasties list. And then finally, Diane gets bitch slapped across the face with the shears, giving her a nice slice across the top of her head. Not sure that that's something that'd be an instant death like that, but you know, what are you gonna do? It's a cool effect. And now, you got the big moment. You got a couple characters in this movie who finally succeed at fucking. It does not last very long, though. Shit. That's all. As Glazer goes off to get some matches, here comes Cropsey with his quarter up on the screen saying, I got next. Because the sexual encounter was so brief, Sally still has a lot of energy left over to fight off those scissors, but not enough to do it forever. And thus she suffers an ambiguous yet decisive death. Glazer returns, not realizing that he's being shadowed by Alfred, who watches as Cropsey pops up from under her body, stabs Glazer, and pins him to a tree. Alfred, now the only person to see Cropsey's handiwork and live to tell the tale, 
runs to tell Todd what happened. Todd, of course, doesn't believe him until he himself gets smacked upside the head with the shears. So Alfred books it with one of the strangest runs I've ever seen a human man perform. So look at that fucking Neolithic sprint. Head placed in the middle of his torso like a retro Ghostbusters action figure. The rest of the still living campers watch as the raft returns. Everyone's on there just laying down. I guess they must be playing dead. Real funny. What a bunch of silly jokesters. <laughs> hey, Eddie. You guys. All right, come on. Enough is enough, huh? <laughs> come on, bring it in, you guys. I regret to inform you that these are not silly jokesters. And thus, the living campers clear the raft of their dead friend's corpses. Sweep it up, asshole! Sweep it up! And go to get help while Todd searches for Alfred, who is captured by Cropsey and brought to an abandoned mine shaft. Originally, this was supposed to be a cave, but they lost the cave location. By some accounts, due to a cave-in, and by others, the cave was just infested with bats. Todd looks up, and he spots the dead body of Karen, who apparently died while making the emoji fuckboy face. And then Cropsey fires up his flamethrower for some poetic justice. And I mean that very specifically, because, as we find out next, it turns out that Todd was one of the kids at the very beginning who burned Cropsey alive. It's a classic wrestling double turn, right? Now we're rooting for Cropsey. Die, Todd, die. Or maybe not. I mean, although the villainous Todd interpretation of this scene is a popular one, it's also important to remember that he kind of was fighting against a child abuser. And then we get the big Cropsey face reveal. Kind of looking like if Nemesis had a baby with an extra cheese pizza. And although the effect looks really good in my opinion, it's creepy, it's gross, it's distinct, Tom Zavini was reportedly not happy with this, having wanted to do a more true-to-life burn effect. Which makes sense, considering that his reason for choosing the burning over the second Friday the 13th movie was that he thought the idea of an adult killer Jason was a stupid idea, and the burning was more grounded in reality, so that's what he wanted to do. Ultimately, Alfred interrupts the main event between Todd and Cropsey, stabbing Cropsey with his own garden shears. So that's it, right? That's the end of Cropsey? I got a lot left in the tank! Well, he doesn't have that much more left in the tank. Cropsey's attempted sleeper hold fails as Todd sends an axe right through his fucking head. And then Alfred finally finishes the job that Todd started all those years ago, burning Cropsey to death with his own flamethrower. You know, in these kinds of movies, it's a common trope that the survivor who defeats the killer in the end is the purest, most innocent, virginal character. But in this one, the hero is the biggest pervert. And the movie ends with a new crop of campers sitting around the campfire, hearing the Cropsey legend themselves. Perhaps setting up that potential sequel that never actually came out as Tony Malum didn't want to be pigeonholed as a horror director, and the movie wound up being a box office flop earning less than half its budget. The Burning is interesting in that although it's been considered among horror fans to be one of the great early slasher films, its connection to the career of Harvey Weinstein has lent itself to a recent reappraisal. As I pointed out a few times here, there's quite a few things in the film that in retrospect, knowing all what we know now, make you kind of go, hmm. And I'm far from the first person to point this out. And that's not even mentioning that this first film also involves his first film-related sex scandal, in which he allegedly exposed himself to a production assistant, Polo Wachowiak, who came to his hotel room to have him sign checks, and he just dropped his towel for her to look at his, his uh, egg dick. Still, I think the gift of hindsight causes us to sometimes look for things where they may not necessarily be. I think it's tempting to assume that every bit and piece of the movie has Harvey Weinstein's fingerprints on it, when really, he's only one of three people with a story credit, and he didn't actually write the screenplay himself. So perhaps the oddities that now seem to be a bit Weinsteinian are all just coincidences. But then again, there is no such thing as a coincidence. That's all for now. If you like this video, check out my video about the furry who ate his own shit. I'm out.